saying. All right, again, um, I'll try to reiterate what I just said very quickly for, for the recording. Um, abstract, just a quick description of the molecule you're trying to make, what the pathway is going, where you're starting, what the pathway is going to be in, in written language. Your introduction um, just going to be, is going to have your actual figures that have your reaction path um, for each of the steps. Um, and again, you don't have to show a mechanism, so you don't need to worry about that for this one, which is good because getting curved arrows to show up properly um, in Microsoft Word is a real bear. Um, so this okay. isn't actually how it's going to look. So Your, Yours is going to be very similar, except for the fact you don't need to show the mechanism. So just, okay, but we do have to just describe it. You have to describe the steps. Remember the, the definition of a mechanism is that it's, it's showing the electron movement. And I don't care about that for this project. I want to know what the steps are, what the intermediates are of each of the reactions in your pathway but you do not need to show me where the electrons are moving um, the way this lab write-up does. Um, and then it's gonna goes into your, the uh, procedure, which is gonna be, have the materials and chemicals and then what the step-by-step -step instructions are. Um, and again, be as, as specific as you can um, when you're writing this section up as far as amounts I'm less, I'm going to be paying attention um, less to about, did you, you know, did you forget to say um, that you need to heat your apparatus up to um, 500 Celsius to drive off water? I don't, I'm not looking for that level of detail. Um, mainly, what are you mixing? What, what reaction vessels are you using? Um, how much of everything are you using? when it comes to the procedure steps. Emily, did you have a question? Okay. Um, yes, I do. So you said it doesn't okay. matter how much we use for the amount or you want us to specifically include that? I do, I want you to include the amounts because I want you to work back the stoichiometry. You're trying to get to 10 grams of product. So you need to work backwards from that say, okay, I need to start with 15 grams of precursor or something like that, or maybe and, more um, than that. Are you gonna be available during class periods next week and lab hours? Because I, as you know, for my schedule, for the rest of the week, I don't have time slots to hit you for lab hours. I can only get you Monday and Tuesday of next week. Are you going to be in lab on those times? Tuesday, in class? Tuesday yes. So and Tuesday, not Monday. and well, so Monday I have regular office hours. Okay. Um, so that, that is on Mondays is two 30 to four <clears throat> on, on Monday. Okay. Okay. Thank you. No problem. All right. So again, I know you guys do, are not actually doing the lab, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and have not had the experience in lab physically in lab. Um, so I'm, I'm mainly looking for the reaction pathways and the stoichiometry and the amounts. What are the overall steps that your reaction is going to do? If you don't get um, the, right, the right steps when it comes to writing out your procedure, if you forget to, to do a recrystallization or you say it should be a recrystallization, but, you, um, but it really should be a solvent-solvent extraction or something like that, I'm not that worried about that. I'm not going to be grading down on that that level of detail all right and um you can are you, you're gonna help us with that because i i honestly i don't know i don't know any of the steps i need to take to get the product i need okay well so, so if you know the individual reactions we've looked at at we haven't actually done the reactions in lab but we have looked at a bunch of procedures this this quarter and last quarter that where we looked at um, you know, what the actual procedures would be to do some of these various steps. And, or if you know, if it's a named reaction or, you know, if you want to, um, if you are going to do an SN2 reaction where, where you're displacing bromine, then, you know, um, 
Google SN2 procedure bromide or hydroxide, whatever your nucleophile is, and get an idea of what the procedure will look like. Um, and then write up. So I, I can I will help you with the with the um, finer points of it, but you um, just just start putting words on paper. Just start saying, okay, well, at the very at the most basic, I know I've got to take you know, eight milliliters of this compound and add it to, to 15 grams of this precursor. So if you just write that down and say, okay, step one, weigh out 15 grams of ethyl benzene or something. Step two, weigh, you know, measure out eight milliliters. Um, whatever your stoichiometry steps have shown you, whatever you've when you've done the math, you just start saying, okay, well, for this first reaction, the, this is what I'm mixing. Um, and then, you know, there might be some, some details in it, but the, the biggest part of it is just start putting, putting down what you're writing for your reaction scheme, start writing it out in, in written word. Um, and I will help you iron out the kinks there, but you, you just, have, you have to start somewhere. So when you have your reaction process done, then just start writing and go from there. Uh, it seems very daunting, but just take it's one reaction at a time. Look up procedures for those individual reactions if you need to. Um, but you, you guys, you can do this. Um, any, any other questions on general, general procedural stuff? For the project. Um, I have a question. Um, is the final going to be available on Tuesday of next week? Uh, yes, that's the final will be available Tuesday through, I think the end of finals week is actually Friday of next week. So Tuesday through Friday. Um, and it'll be, and I'll, I will have, um, by Thursday at the latest, I will have the practice test for you to, to work on. And then Tuesday in our regular lab, our regular lecture time slot on next Tuesday um, will, be, will be review hour where you, know, you can come in, ask questions about the practice test. Um, and there, so we'll, we'll basically treat that as the review session. We'll also have the lab hours for next Tuesday as well. We won't be meeting to do anything. So you can use it as extra office hours if you have that time slot available. Which I know it's finals week, so things get, um, our schedules get a little bit, a little bit weird. <clears throat> All right, anything else about um, this assignment for right now. Yeah. Um, so, for example, uh, one of the reactions I'm doing is like a radical bromination. Mm -hmm. um, so, one of my in terms of like the stoichiometry, I'm kind of tripping myself up because if I just look at the reactants, you know, my precursor Br2 goes to, you know, an alkane with one bromine on it, but I should take into account like the, the hydrobromic acid that I'm going to make during that process and include that in like my stoichiometry or? So for radical bromination, um, everything balances as, as ones across the board, right? It takes one molecule of Br2 and of the two bromines that are in the, in the Br2, one of the bromines atoms gets added onto your alkane and the other bromine atom turns into HBr. So you are making both your, your product and the HBr, but everything's in a one-to-one -one ratio. If you start with one mole of bromine, you're gonna make one mole of your alkane, your brominated alkane and one mole of HBr. So that, that makes sense. At first I was thinking one half, but 
yeah, you've got to take into consideration the stuff you don't really want. And that, like, take into consideration, like, how I'm going to get rid of, like, the hydrobromic acid, like, look at the boiling point, think about distillation kind of stuff. Yeah, it might be distillation. It might be a liquid-liquid extraction because HBr should be very, very polar, right? It's a strong acid, so it should be very highly soluble in water. But an organic product would not be. So you could do a liquid-liquid extraction where you mix a non-polar solvent with water, and your HBr should dissolve in the water layer, and your non and your non-polar product should dissolve in the liquid layer. And as far as like the purification, should we be considering like if not all of our reactants or not all of our starting material was converted, like look at the boiling point of the alkane and include that in like a distillation process or? Um, so if you're going to do a distillation to, to get to get your desired product out and you think there are going to be other things in there you want to make sure that you're only saving the stuff that distills it's condensing at the right temperature so if you know your product is going to condense at 100 celsius but then there's your leftover reactant that that distills at and condenses at 80 celsius then you're going to throw away everything that comes over that that condenses at 80 celsius you're going to collect that and set it aside and then switch to a new vessel when you get to 100 celsius and that's the stuff you're going to keep that makes sense and for like potassium terpene oxide i'm going to wind up with like potassium ions floating around and that's going to be more like liquid liquid because you know they'll be attracted to a polar solvent i would imagine Yes. Yeah. So anything ionic is going to dissolve in, is going to preferentially dissolve in water. So that's why salt, liquid liquid extractions are really, really useful in OCHEM because all, any of our ionic byproducts or any of our ionic reactants are going to dissolve in the, in the aqueous layer. Right. So you might go back to what was one of our first labs. I think this, this quarter we talked maybe it was last quarter we talked about uh, liquid liquid extraction what the procedure is you know like 15 milliliters of water with with 15 milliliters of dichloromethane and invert it and then use the sep funnel drain off the bottom layer um so you can definitely use some of the procedures if you um from our other labs even if it's not as cemented in your head as to this is how we would do it because we didn't physically do it um, you still have those procedures there. So you might check some of the um, lab procedures that we looked at earlier this quarter as to, to how to write this up or what your procedure might look like. And you might do a lot of co copy and pasting within your own um, within your own procedure or even you know just say, here's my process. This is my process for, for doing a liquid liquid extraction at the beginning and then if you're going to do that three three more times in your procedure you could just say do a liquid liquid extraction just like step three you don't need to rewrite the same words over and over again and you can use those other procedures that are out there just if you use anything um, that you didn't write yourself make sure that you you cite it as a source at the end and i i, I feel like i'm using the same solvent for the majority of my steps but I don't see why that would be a problem. Just kind of following the idea that I'll use like 10% more solvent, like in terms of moles as compared to the reactant. But I'm not even totally sure if I really need solvent if like, if everything's liquid that I'm using. Yeah, if, if, you, are, if you have a reactant that is liquid, that um, you can absolutely just add your reactants together if the, if everything's liquid to start with and just let it react that way. Um, that's totally fine. And when it comes to using the same the same solvent or the same steps over and over again, or this you say, I'm using the same glassware over and over again, that doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. In all likelihood, that means you're doing it right. The, the object is not to make things as complicated as possible. The object is to make things as simple as possible. And so when that means you can use the same 
Um, do you have a, is that a Conyer Elkie? Um, yeah, yeah, it's a Conyer. <laughs> um, it, when, when it means you can get away using your same, the same solvent over and over again, or the same steps over and over again to accomplish different things, that's a good thing. The, the engineer's motto is, is an engineer's job is not done when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to remove. The whole idea is you make things as simple as possible that still gets you the desired result. And as far as like knowing that my reaction is completed, I can, you know, it seems safe to assume that if I've got a solid reactant, by the time that's completely dissolved, probably the reaction is pretty much completed. But a lot, if I'm doing, you know, liquid, liquid reactants, um, not really too sure how to like figure out a timeline for how long. That's a, that's, that's one where, where Google be, could be your friend or any of the other, um, procedures that are similar. If you're doing a, you know, an SN2 reaction and you have a, um, and you remember we looked at SN2 procedures from, from last quarter, you can go back and look at, okay, well, this one was, um, said to reflux for 25 minutes. So I'm just going to say that. Um, and again, that's the sort of thing that if we were actually doing this in person, we'd, we'd work that through. We'd test a couple different lengths. Remember the synthesis of aspirin one where it said, okay, you, it said, pretend like you ran it for this long, this long, this long, which one of those is the best option. That's really what we would do in real life if we were trying to get this to be the best possible yield, the most efficient as possible. Um, so use Google, especially if you can find Google where you've got a similar looking leaving group or a similar looking nucleophile. Say, okay, well, this procedure from Google says that they reflux for 45 minutes. So I'm gonna use that. All right, I feel like I've been hogging for long enough. No, you're asking good questions. Anybody else want to piggyback on those or ask something else? This is definitely an assignment where you're going to run up that fine line um, where you, you, I don't expect you to do this in a vacuum. I expect you to use online resources. It just means cite your sources and don't just copy and paste somebody else's procedure but definitely, and you know, use the name of the reaction you're looking at. Okay, I'm using a Grignard reagent here. Google Grignard reagent procedure, or even you know, use the specific Grignard reagent you're looking at. There's so many just PDFs of, of OCHEM procedures out there for all of these reactions that you guys are doing. So use those as starting points and then just adapt them, put in your reagents and your amounts um, make sure that you're using the right stuff from our stock room um, PDF that I gave you and, and use that as your, your starting point for all of these. I was also getting confused with doing the sodium amide and ammonia thing again, because I was I feel like I'd want to use pure ammonia, but it looks like the density of pure ammonia is like super not dense. So you would wind up using a huge amount of ammonia, like 27 liters or something. So that's probably the density of ammonia as a gas. The density of ammonia as a liquid should be something close to water. It might not be quite as dense as water, but it should be close to a one gram per milliliter. Yeah, I think I saw a 0.9 somewhere, so that would make sense. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, so that should change that. If you if you get something, if you look up for the density of ammonia and it gives you, you know, 0.02 grams per liter, grams per milliliter, or something like that, that's probably the gas density. All right. All right. Format. So um, the main criteria for, for the format for citations is um, that I can find the right paper again. So usually it's first author, second author, if there's more than two at all. And then 
So let me, I'll do this on, uh, see if I can just do this. So something like, First author, author by last name, second author. So you just list out the names. Um, I'm not gonna get super picky about the formatting, but what you need are the names of the, at least the first and second authors, um, the title of the work, usually italicized, but again, I'm not gonna be that picky. So, and I can't italicize here anyway. So. So maybe it's um, kinetics of free radical chromination is the name of the article. And it was published in um, Journal of Physical Organic Chemistry. And then you would put the the year. So, and if there's a link, if it's a, a hyperlinked paper, or if it has a DOI um, number, then you would just write that that link here, and either just put link or put the DOI number. Um, Right, so essentially what you're, um, different journals will have different requirements for this as far as the exact formatting. The main thing that I'm looking for is if I looked at your citation, if I, if I just copy and pasted your citation into Google, is it gonna give me the right paper? If, if that's true, then you probably did it well enough. Right, so authors, title, journal is the, are the main pieces. Elke? Do you want in-text citations? Um, you don't need to do like footnotes or anything like that. So in, in the text, you, you would say, okay, um, you know, I'm, I used, I followed the procedure similar to this paper and then say the author's name in, and then at the end, you just have a list of sources. So as long as I can identify which one you're talking about in your list of sources at the end, um, but you don't, again, I'm, I'm, so if you said something in the paper like, um, follow the SN2 procedure, for um, as laid out in um, in I don't know Ryland Ryland's two thousand one paper, and then you would just in parentheses um, put the name of the paper. And, uh, and Ryland, and then that way I can find it out of the list at the end. Um, but, so it can be. Are there, do you have a minimum um, amount of references we need to have? We don't nope. have to have any? You don't have to have any, okay. but you, everything that you write better be your own, your own thoughts at that point. Um, or, or coming from the procedures that I that I gave you guys in this class. If you're using anything outside of what we did in this class, it needs a citation. Okay, so like you'd like to see mastering organic chemistry in our references? Yeah, if you use that as one of your as okay. one of your sources, then yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and again, so if it's not something that's published in a journal like this. Just give me the give me the title of it because I don't even know what the author's name is for mastering organic chemistry, um, or if it's if it's public on there. So at the at the least, so that so here's here's your double check is if you 
if you are trying to cite something, if you can copy and paste what you wrote as your citation and the first Google hit that comes up is the page that you used, then that's that's good enough. All right. So as professional as possible. So the way I always remembered it um, with these citations is you know, have like your citation, an idea of what it would be if you had every piece of information. And just if you don't have it for a particular source, leave it out. If you don't have an author for this particular um, article, leave off the author section and just quote the article title and where you found it. If you don't have, if it's not published in a journal, you leave off the journal. If you don't have the year of publication, leave off the year. So this is sort of like, if you have all of this information, this is what you would include. If you're missing anything from this, you just leave it off your citation and make sure that I can get to it if I wanna check it. Okay. As far as I remember, I, I have not thought about that in that much detail in a very long time. But after freshman composition, where you have to learn how to write a research paper in, in English, one of, what is it, 103 at our school, um, after I took that class, I don't think I ever really got marked down on citations after that, because all I ever did was include all the information I had in this general format. And if I missed, didn't have something, just leave it off. That's, that's a pretty good rule of thumb. Anything else? I see. All right. Well, I'll let you guys, I'll stop talking. I'll let you guys keep working on this. Like I said, we'll have a few more. We will not cover all of the slides that we were supposed to do today. We won't do a full lecture probably. Um, we'll probably do about a half lecture on Thursday and and wrap up, um, wrap up at least a chunk of chapter 17, get us to a good spot so that when we come back after break, um, we're ready to, to jump into aromatic compounds. Elke? Sorry, I was, um, I was gonna say, could you show us how to use, more, or is it very easy just to download the image from MoleView? Uh, I can show you that, yeah. Okay. So there's a couple options. Let me get it pulled up and then I'll sh um, screen share here. So when you've got the the compound that you want to look at, so we are going to not be dealing with 3D structures as much, although you can include those, I suppose, if you want. Um, um, drawing the structures is fairly is fairly self-explanatory. You just have to take a little bit of trial and error for some of them to figure out how to add things. If you don't want the hydrogens to show up, then you click this button. Um, if you don't want the colors you click this button here it looks like a color wheel um again i'm i'm not going to be picky so use your judgment what do you think looks aesthetic more aesthetically pleasing color or no color with your paper um when it comes to actually exporting these you can either if you have a screen grab tool so i don't know what it's called on on mac but on um, Windows, it looks like the symbol for it is a little um, little scissors. It's called either snipping tool or snip and sketch, depending on what version you have. Um, and when you hit when you hit new with that, um, you basically just click and grab, and that just copies it to your clipboard. So from there, you can actually just copy and paste it straight into Word. Um, so with just with, you know, either right, right click and go to paste or control V if you're using keyboard shortcuts, and then it's in there. Um, the other way you can do it is a little bit, might be a little bit easier to format. That's, that's the fastest way to do it. That's the way I usually do it in, um, for, for my lectures and things. But if you wanted a higher quality one, um, once you get the figure that you're looking at, so if we wanted to export the structure for caffeine, we'd go to tools 
And under the export here, you can um, you just want the structural formula image. We'll just export it just like this as a ping. And then when if you open it, you get your figure here. Um, I I think it's it's actually far easier to use just use a snipping tool or screen grab tool um, or print screen even the command print screen on your keyboard usually just takes a screenshot of the entire uh, of your the entire screen and puts it on your clipboard so I actually haven't done that on this computer but if I hit the print screen button. And paste it in here. I get the entire screen that I was looking at. Um, and if then if I wanted to to cut down, cut the zoom windows out of it, make it look better, you just go to crop, and that just allows you to cut out the side, the pieces that you're not using, and then you can resize it however you want. All right, so a couple different options for getting figures out. When it comes to actually drawing them, your tools are all the way, all along the left-hand side. And then if you wanna pick different atoms, different elements, they're all along the right-hand side. If you want something that's not there, click on the dot, dot, dot at the bottom and it opens up a whole periodic table for you. All right, so if I wanted to draw phenyl magnesium bromide or something, a Grignard reagent, or take benzene, attach magnesium to the bromine, attach bromine to magnesium, there's your phenyl magnesium bromide. All right, so it's very, um, very intuitive, click and drag. And you can get rid of the colors if you want as well. Um, there, that said, there are a ton of other chemical structure drawing programs out there. Mulvey is just the one that I found to be the most um, user friendly and um, powerful for how easy it is to use and how quickly it runs. Any other any other questions on on the uh, assignment at this point, or any of the specific software specific stuff too? I guess if you wanted to, um, I can show you if you're using Word, if you're using. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're using um, Google Google Docs, then I don't know exactly how their equation editor works. If you're using Microsoft Word, the equation editor is a really convenient way to to show the uh, reaction steps. Um, you just go to Insert, and then under the the ribbon for Insert, there's an option for Equation, which just gives you an empty blank space. But it has a lot of tools here. All of a sudden. And allows you to do things like, um, you know, like sigma notation. It's really designed around. Um, no, go back. Um, around math equations, but it has a lot of chemistry stuff in there too. That's the button I ruined. Um, so you can do things like. Uh, where is it? Here you go. Operator structures. So if you wanted to say put an arrow, then said exposed to ethanol. It's really small right now, but then you can then take this and and then just treat it like you would treat a text box. Um, and it's it supports doing um, subscripts. So if I wanted to say water instead. Um, you can, that has a bunch of, it's, you can type stuff in, in latex is a, is a programming language for typing, um, equations. If you know that you can use that, it interprets it well, or you can just use these buttons 
So if I wanted to say H3O plus, um, I could add this there and say, okay, H3 and then O. It takes a little bit of practice to get the uh, exact formatting right, but then you can do things like H3O, get rid of this first H, plus aqueous. So it allows you to do a lot of the superscript subscript stuff pretty easily, put it over an arrow. So that can be really helpful for making it look good too. You can also just do it with, um, if you just use um, just regular, a regular arrow, make it look, you know, the right weight. So and then just insert a uh, text box uh, above above that as well. So you can you don't have to use the equation editor if the equation editor has got too many moving pieces and it's more trouble than it works. You can just put in an arrow like this and then just put a text box above it for your other reactants as well. <clears throat> which would just look, there you go, something like, now you have to fight with Excel to get it so that everything doesn't jump, doesn't uh, move everything else every time you move it. But, um, so if I want to say H2, H2SO4, for instance, I would just put that in a text box above my arrow, get rid of the lines around it. It's, it just becomes, a, um, you know, you just have to figure out how to make it look the way you want it to look by playing around with, with Word a little bit for some of these. Um, and that might be where the equation editor has an advantage is, is in some of that formatting. But again, <clears throat> do your best to make it look professional, make sure that the figures look nice the, the structures i mean look nice do your best on the arrows and the, the reactions um and see what we can do make it look and once you do this that screen grab tool is useful all over the place because if i have to do the same reaction three times you don't you can either copy and paste the whole thing and put it elsewhere or you can once you have this drawn out the way you want it everything positioned the way you want it then you can do something like pull up your screen grab and I forgot to unselect something before I did it, um, but then you've got it all as one big object. So then you don't have to worry about things moving around as much. Um, it's not a glamorous job, but believe me when I say when I was working on writing grants in grad school, I, at least 25% of my time was spent fighting with Microsoft Office and trying to get it to let me put things where I wanted it to put them and where make them look the way they should look. So it is a skill that will continue to be useful as you want to uh, graduate and get a real job somewhere. Um, being able to make Office look the way it should look is a useful skill. So use this as an opportunity to try that out, do as best you can. And, uh, and go from there. All right, anything else at this point? The, the tricks that I didn't learn in grad school when it comes to Microsoft Office, I, I learned once I started having to my, write my own lectures and make le lecture slides as well. So um, when it comes to PowerPoint and Excel especially, um, I know lots of tricks. If you're hung up on one specific thing, you can't get it to do what you want to do. Just let me know and I might be able to help you via email if you're not in person um, or just make a note of it and come and bring it to, uh, to class on Tuesday or Thursday. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, any other? 
Yeah, go ahead, Cody. So making this look all professional, like a regular lab procedure, I assume we're gonna leave out like showing our worth with like stoichiometry and stuff like that? Um, yes, you, you do not need to show your work is um, the way that it would be done. Let's say for whatever reason, I was trying to write a paper and it was gonna be published and um, I felt the need to show the stoichiometry for one of the steps. You can always, what you can do is it, to show your work, say, here, show your work for one problem and say, we use the same procedure for the rest of this, something like that. And you, and so instead of, of drawing, writing it out by hand, you would do the same thing that we were just describing. Um, equation editor actually does really well for um, stoichiometry problems as well. So you could do something like, um, sorry, where'd my zoom window go? There you are. Um, so if I wanted to show my work and, ex um, and it was going to be written as a, as a conversion, I could say, okay, well, 1.50 grams of whatever, and then I can say, put it in brackets and then within the brackets, you can turn it into a fraction. And then you can say, you know, let's, let's say it's water we're talking about. And so we can say 18.01 grams of water is, um, is one mole water so that this is how I, I type up all of the slides for um for gen chem when it comes to teaching conversions um so you can anything you can show mathematically you can do with the equation editor there are very few things one of the about the only thing that i consistently want equation editor to do to do that it doesn't have built into it um, is I can't get it to let me draw an arrow that has something above the arrow and below the arrow. Um, so other than that, pretty much everything else that you would might want to show mathematically, Equation Editor can do. So you can play around with that. Uh, and there's a way to get Excel to do it. I just have to figure it out again every time because it's not built in. So if I take this, all of this, and then put it inside one of the other scripts or something like that. Anyway, you don't need to watch me. Oh yeah, something like that. And then I could put something underneath. It doesn't look exactly the same, but it's close. Um, <clears throat> again, not gonna be super picky on that. Do the best you can. Brute force it with text boxes. Text boxes are the, the way you can always make sure it works. Uh, can a Grignard reagent act as a nucleophile when reacting with a molecule with OTS, like ethanol? Yeah, I'll open up some breakout rooms. <clears throat> um, so all that the OTS does when you convert an alcohol to OTS, it makes that oxygen a better leaving group. So any nucleophile that you could use, you would normally use also works. That's just a way to get you get better yield when it comes to, because a lot of times a Grignard reagent is not a strong enough nucleophile to push oxygen off. If that oxygen is in the form of an alcohol, because OHs are not a very good leaving group. So the OTS converts it to a better leaving group and then a Grignard reagent could come in and displace it. Um, the other place we see the Grignard reagents is it was in making the alcohols, because if you have a carbonyl, a carbonyl is, is a good enough target for a nucleophile that you can come in and break up that carbon oxygen pi bond. Um, but if you're trying to get an oxygen to leave and be replaced with something else, then you would convert the OH to OTS. And then you can have a Grignard reagent come in and, and attack and push the oxygen off. That would work. <clears throat> what about like including like the junk products that we don't really care about 
you want to show that in like the synthesis steps or um only only in so much as that it's going if it if you have four products that are all equally likely based on some addition reaction you could get the r or the s of two di two different carbons could get get the the um adding group put on them and each one would give you an r versus an s so if you got four possible products that are all equally likely then you would want to make sure that you write them just so to the extent that you can say you we're only going to get at most 25 percent yield but if you have one major product we can we can ignore everything else as long as your product is more than 50 percent of of the yield which most of these reactions it will be um then you don't have to show the rest of it does that make sense yeah but you would still include in the procedure like you know whatever to get rid of whatever right we don't you don't even need to say what those other products are going to be you can just say to to remove byproducts we use this step we used a, yeah, a recrystallization step or something like that right so it's Remember, it's not that the other things don't happen. It's just that we don't care about them in this context. The only thing we're zoomed in on for this project is how do I get my product with as much yield as possible? And we anything else that's not related to that is just extra information. We don't care about it for right now. All right, let's 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 take a quick break. I'll leave this up and running, some breakout rooms open for anybody um, who wants to jump into a breakout room um, and uh, keep talking about this or, or helping you guys out with anything you're stuck on. When we come back, let's say 10 minutes, come back at two after two.
So Sean. Um, so I, I saw the email you sent me back um, and I redrew it. And by intermediate, you just mean um, showing that positive charge or, hold on, wait a minute. I just meant like you you could show the deprotonated isopropanol if you if you were going to show that as an intermediate like the amide is there mm -hmm. just to deprotonate it you don't need to show the electron movement you can just show that you made the iso the two propanoxide which I guess would be the name of it the deprotonated alcohol. Okay, and so is should I have like a whole new step or because it's so hard because when I think about it in reaction it's all happening at the same time so I'm drawing it out I'm drawing out the deep protonization well can I show you what I have right now maybe yeah so wait what I have wait what you saw I mean actually I just drew the um the positive charge here but this this isn't what you're looking for no you don't need so the curved arrows are the electron movement right that's the part that's that's not necessary to show um and really the the you don't need to show the intermediates that have charges either mm -hmm. because the, all of the charged molecules are going to be so unstable mm -hmm. that you're mostly going to be I'm, I'm mostly looking for what's happening in between the or not in between the steps at at the end of that step before you start the next reaction Okay, so I can just write out like um, the two propanol and then um, the amide, and then it's just assumed it's deprotonating it. Yes. Okay, and then just the bromine leaves immediately to my end compound. I don't have to show the positive charges. Right. Okay. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so I don't have to draw the two propanol. Like I don't have to draw the figure. Just the chemical compound. Okay. Okay, thank you. No problem.